This video will discuss an alternative to XYZ coordinates for representing molecular coordinates, and that is called a Z matrix. So as we've said in previous videos, let's say we have N atoms to begin with. So we know that in XYZ coordinates, that means we're going to have three N coordinates. But of those, only three N minus six are unique or our so-called internal coordinates. And six of these values are redundant. So six of them are redundant. And three of those end up being translations. And three of them end up being rotations. So what if instead of XYZ coordinates, we used a molecular coordinate system that only had all the unique coordinates? It had 3n minus 6 coordinates, uh, or 3n minus 5 if it was linear, well, close enough. So we're just interested in, in eliminating this redundant information, and there's another format we can use for that, and that is called a Z matrix. Okay, so a Z matrix, as noted, has 3n minus 6 internal degrees of freedom. Internal degrees of freedom and 0 are redundant. They are all important and they are all unique and necessary to spec specify a molecular uh, conformation. Okay, so what we're going to have is a list of atoms. So on the first atom, we have the element only. So in an XYZ, the first atom would have three coordinates. Uh, those are all redundant coordinates because we can put the first atom wherever we like, uh, but it doesn't change anything about the energy. So that's getting rid of those three translations there by only having, uh, by having zero coordinates for that first element. It, it's just the element only for the first atom. Okay, so for our second atom, we have the element and a bond length. Now, this removes two of those redundant rotations because the only thing that matters is how far away this atom is relative to atom one. So we could, for example, constrain this to be at the origin, and we could constrain the second atom to be on the z-axis. So in, in this terms, our, if we wanted to make it unique, we could have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, r1 for the bond length for making our coordinates unique thus far. Okay, so that's now we've gotten rid of five of those redundant coordinates, so we're getting rid of the last one with the third atom. So third atom has element and bond length and a bond angle. So for the third atom, it matters how far it is from either the second atom or the first atom, whichever is specified. And then it matters what angle it is uh, relative to uh, the other atom that we have that we've specified. So the three atoms here form a plane. So you can't put this atom anywhere and that, that'll make it outside of that plane because three nonlinear points define a plane. So for this third atom here, we're getting rid of that uh, second, we're getting rid of that third and final redundant rotation. And now every atom moving forward will have three coordinates and they will all be uh, unique and non-redundant internal degrees of freedom. So for the fourth and beyond, we have the element and the bond length and a bond angle and a torsion angle. So this is one reason why we've brought up bond lengths, bond angles, and torsions in the previous set of videos is that that is how we define coordinates in Z matrix form. So the fourth and beyond all the way to the nth atom We'll have this. Okay, so now if we notice we've added up, we have 0, plus 1, plus 2, 
and then plus three every atom beyond that. And that will add up to three n minus six. Okay, so let's try to do an example here of a particular Z matrix. So if I look in Avogadro, if this will load, Okay, so looking in Avogadro, I've got an ethane molecule here. So I have two carbons, three hydrogens over here, three hydrogens over here. So if I declared my <clears throat> atoms in this order, I would have to find a reasonable set of bond angles, bond lengths, and torsion angles to describe this geometry. Okay, so first up, I'm going to define our first carbon atom. So we have C, that's our first line, element only. Then our second line is gonna be C, the next carbon. And so in parentheses over here, we'll have a running total of the atom numbers here. Okay, our second atom is gonna be C, and then one, because it's bonded to atom one, the carbon. And that bond length, if I measure it in Avogadro, as I have it drawn here, is 1.512 angstroms. So let me put that at 1.51. Just, I'll truncate it there for now. Okay, the next atom is a hydrogen, hydrogen three. Hydrogen three is bonded to atom one. So three is bonded to one, and it has an angle to, to atom two. So the bond angle is 110.6 degrees and the bond length is 1.094 angstroms. So this hydrogen is bonded to atom one at 1.09 angstroms. And then it has an angle from three to one to two of, if I remember what that value was, 110.6 degrees. Okay, then we're gonna do hydrogen number four uh, same situation, hydrogen number four is bonded to carbon one and it is, has an angle with atom two. Uh, notice also that we have to use atoms that we've already defined, so I couldn't use atoms five, six, seven, or eight yet because I haven't defined those. So I have to, f so I have to f with these three atoms, define a bond length, a bond angle, and a torsion angle. So if I measure those in Avogadro from one 1.094, 110.6 degrees, and then torsion there of minus 120. I can check that out as well. Putting that up there, so that torsion is indeed minus 120 there. Okay, so I have to say H1, 1.09, 2, 110.6, and then torsion angle to atom three, which is minus 120.0 degrees. Okay, uh, atom five is gonna be the same thing, except for if I also make it to atom four, you'll notice that the torsion angle is now gonna end up being positive instead of negative. So if we do five, one, two, three, now it's positive 120 instead of negative 120. It's on the other side, looking down this bond, minus 120 on this side, positive 120 on this side. Okay, so we have H1, 1.09, all those bond, all those CH bond distances are the same. All of the HCC bond angles are the same. And to three, positive 120. Okay, then I can do the same things for atoms six, seven, and eight. I don't necessarily have to define them all relative to any of these individual atoms here, but um, I, can, I can pick any atoms that have already been defined, but sometimes it's just more convenient to pick one in particular. So let's see. We have six, seven, and eight. We have relative to six is staggered across from five, so maybe I'll pick five. So that's gonna be a 180 degree torsion there. 
So if I say 6, 2, 1, 5, 6, 2, 1, 5. So that bond length is still the same. That bond angle is still going to be the same. And this is going to be 180 degrees. And I can define the same things for the other ones because they're bonded to the same atoms. They're each only bonded to uh, carbon 2. Same bond distance, same bond angle because of the symmetry. And then number 7, let's see. I believe 7 is going to be positive 60 degrees for the torsion and 8 is going to be negative 60 degrees for the torsion. So let's just confirm that. So we have 7, 2, 1, 5, positive 60, 8, 2, 1, 5, minus 60. Oops. Maximize that there. Minimize that. If it'll go away, there it goes. Okay, so then we have a positive 60 and a minus negative 60 there. Okay, so as I mentioned, all the redundant coordinates are missing here. We have eight atoms, and we have seven bond lengths, six bond angles, and five uh, torsion angles for a total of five plus six is 11, plus seven is 18, uh, 3n here is 24, 3n minus six is 18. So that agrees with that formula there. Okay, so what we do, what we've done here is this bond length constrains this atom to a sphere, which is 1.51 angstroms away from the atom that it's bonded to. Same thing for all these other atoms. So we're constrained to a sphere from the first coordinate. Once we add in the bond angle, we're constrained to a circle because we have uh, a circle of values that have this bond length and this bond angle. And then finally, the torsion angle tells us where we fall inside of that circle. Okay, so uh, most quantum chemistry programs will use both of these types of input uh, structures uh, for specifying molecular geometry. Sometimes it just depends. Sometimes it's easier to build things in Cartesian. Sometimes it's easier to build them in Z-matrix. Um, it all depends on the application, uh, but they are both widely used formats in computational chemistry.